If we want to understand what ancient hominins ate, we have to use indirect clues. One of the most important of those clues is the chemistry of their bones and teeth. Stable isotopes of carbon, of nitrogen, and the ratios of other elements like calcium and strontium give us information about the foods that ancient hominins were eating. One of the world's experts on stable isotopes in human evolution is Matt Sponheimer. Matt is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. And I caught up with Matt and his team in the field in the Cradle of Humankind Natural Area in South Africa, where they were assessing the properties of plants in that area in what was the South African winter. I also talked to Matt at greater length about his work building a database of stable isotope data for early hominins and what his work is telling us about the diets of these ancient people. Okay, so Matt, um, tell me what stable isotopes tell us about the diets of ancient hominins. Yeah, the stable isotope work is based upon the principle that you are what you eat, more uh -huh. or less. And really, we're mostly interested in carbon. And the carbon in foods ultimately find their way into your tissues. And of direct relevance for work with the fossil record, we like teeth. Because uh -huh. teeth preserve well in the fossil record. And teeth are largely pre-fossilized. Yep. Unlike bone, where you've got lots of organic teeth, it's almost entirely mineral. Um, you know, during your lifetime. Uh -huh. So the issue is during the time your teeth are mineralizing, carbon from your meals and things ultimately becomes incorporated in there and it's frozen in time, yeah. in essence. So millions of years after the fact, you know, we can sit there and retrieve the carbon um, that an individual ate over a period of months or in some cases years. Uh -huh. And oftentimes that carbon can tell us a lot about diet. The most important things it distinguishes for us is the differences between C3 and C4 plant consumptions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it sounds fancy, but the bottom line for our purposes is that they have different ratios of carbon-13 to carbon-12 okay. in their tissues. C3 plants here are things like well, our trees, you know, most of our shrubs, mm -hmm. bushes, and whatnot. Um, our C4 plants... You know, all around us we have these African C4 tropical grasses. Yeah. Um, there are also sedges uh -huh. that you'll see around here, particularly along some of the wetland environments. Uh -huh. Those are C4 kind of plants. There are a few other things, but not much else. So we like to see, well, are they eating C3 or C4 things? And why would anyone care about this? Well, part of it is that C4 is intimately tied to things like savanna environments, yeah. right? And yeah. that's always been the story. Well, are hominids engaging with new dietary resources when new environments are sort of coming about? Or at least that's been the story. There's a lot of, it's obviously contested at this point. Um, but as it's turned out, um, there is something really interesting going on. Chimpanzees today, even when they do live in these savanna environments, broadly speaking, uh -huh. um, really are very highly dependent on C3 resources. This isn't to say that they don't eat, you know, a piece of elephant grass or something on occasion. Obviously, there's a little bit, but it's so small that we really can't discern it from an isotopic perspective. Yep. When you start now getting to about, eh, about 3.5 million years is our best guess at this point, we start seeing hominins do that. Uh -huh. Intriguingly, the brand new data that coming out of Terry Serling's lab is showing that about 4 million years ago, the early hominins are more or less looking like chimpanzees. Uh -huh. By about 3.5 million years ago, by the time Lucy is coming around mm -hmm. and, and her ilk, all of a sudden we see new things going on. All of a sudden we see certain things that look a little bit like a chimpanzee and other things that arguably are engaging with these broader resources in these savannas. Now, whether or not that means they're eating these C4 grasses directly, which people don't often, they're not fond of that idea usually, uh -huh. Or maybe eating sedges, and that could be some above ground parts, or things like corm, some of these underground nutritious parts. Uh -huh. Or eating animals eating those things, we can't tell directly from an isotopic perspective. Sure. Admittedly, when you take the isotopes and things like dental morphology and use certain you know, basic ecological principles, you might say, well, something like Paranthropus boisei, we might say, well, that's that's a really extreme version of what's going on. They are dominated by C4 vegetation. They almost like like ze zebra. Were, were you surprised when you saw that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, we saw that 
Here in South Africa, we saw that a long time ago. And yeah. one of the things that's really interesting and fun about this technique is that this was pioneered by South African researchers. Yeah. And, uh, and it's something that, you know, we've improved, the, you know, the community that's engaged with this over the years. But a heck of a lot of the really important stuff was done right here in South Africa. And we saw some of the very, very early data on Boise Eye, sort of before it was, you know, well before it was published. And it uh -huh. was intriguing because it was only two specimens. Yeah. Like, could this be real? Yeah. And the problem is anytime you have a, a sample of two, you're like, well, you know, the, the, we could have just gotten the two weirdos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, out there. Yeah. And... Um, you know, we were able to finally go and get a much larger sample from Kenya. Uh -huh. And it turned out that those potential weirdos were actually the norm. Yeah. And yeah. the mean didn't change when we added, you know, an additional now 24 specimens or more to the mix. So, you know, to see a hominin, a large, a hominoid of that body size. Yeah. That looks more like a warthog or uh -huh. a zebra isotopically than a chimpanzee. Did it surprise me? Yeah. Yeah. Now, there'll be some people who say, well, Cliff Jolly said stuff like this maybe a long time ago. True enough. But who was saying this 10 years ago? Yeah. Pretty much no one. Yeah. So this might be one of those things where, you know, we're rediscovering old ideas. But I don't even want to go that far because the bottom line is we do not know whatever these C4 resources were. Yeah. The ones that are eaten sometimes in significant amounts by these things at 3.5, 2.5 and so forth. Or the things that are eaten in huge quantities by things like Paranthropus robustus. Uh -huh. And maybe it was different for different taxa. Maybe something like early Homo, where we, there is quite a lot of C4 in some of that. Maybe that was animal foods. Or maybe it was, maybe it was you know, sedge, sedge underground organs. But, you know, maybe Paranthropus, it was something like grass seeds and, and you know, underground parts of grasses, which some baboon populations eat quite a lot of. And, you know, this is... These are these are nice questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so we've gone from a point where it was very difficult to get samples like this, where yeah. you know you were trying to make inferences based on really a handful of specimens, to your recent papers where you have you know just dozens and dozens of hominid specimens included. Um, how did that happen? Yeah, well, I'll tell you the early days it was very difficult when Julia Lee Thorpe pioneered this doing the first uh -huh. study and she actually tried to get this pu published in nature and you know Ju julie always tells me the story and one of the or one of the reviewers said well this is clearly fascinating but you can't publish this because if you do people will destroy all of our fossils <laughs> and that's you know the first ever review of yeah. a stable isotope early hominin paper and so yeah. it did not get published in nature and she eventually published it some years later but in those early years then you know julie and i published in 1999 the australopithecus africanus and we had a sample of four yeah so you know we're dealing with a, a grand total of about a dozen specimens yeah and it didn't change much for for over a decade uh-huh and we managed to improve the sample a little bit um, in the early 2000s, and then all of a sudden, starting about 2009, the floodgates opened. Uh -huh. And part of this is, you know, there are a number of things involved. One, people became convinced, oh, this is really, there, there is something interesting here. Yeah. This is going to help us address questions that, you know, we really want to answer. I think at the very beginning, people were like, well, what is this? You know, who cares about C3 or C4? Uh -huh. But of course, it gets deeper than just C3, C4 when you really think through it. Uh, the other part is, you know, fossil curate, curators of the fossils um, were understandably reluctant to allow sample sampling that damages yeah. the specimens. Yeah. Now, and one of the things that was really difficult, from very early time, we were doing minimal damage. I mean, yeah. the kind that was really hard to even see with the naked eye. Yeah. Um, but they just got these visions of, you know, huge drills and holes. And on occasion, the earliest stuff was did a lot of damage and it really took a long time to convince people and then eventually when we really moved in and started doing some stuff in Kenya and so forth um, people were like you know really this is all you need you know you know if we had known that all along it would have been much easier it is a point where the field has advanced so much by using more modern techniques I mean it, it is true that in the 70s and earlier people were taking destructive samples of fossils yeah. for reasons that today we would view as, you know, really 
you know, we would never allow it. Right. Um, but, you know, when we think of how things have changed with stable isotopes, how things have changed with genetics, you know, where the amount of information you can get about the lives of these ancient people or ancient hominins has increased so much. It's, uh, it's, it's really stunning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm very excited about it for a couple of reasons. Like the Boise eye is, was just such a great example. Mm -hmm. There is no way we would be thinking about Boise eye the way we're starting to think about it without the isotope stuff. Yeah. Now it's not isotopes change the world in themselves. I mean, all yeah. the techniques are really important. And I think when someone becomes, falls in love with any particular method, you know, troubles right around the corner, <laughs> you know, we really want to use them all in tandem because they're yeah. all telling us different things about diet. Yeah. You know, stable isotopes are really, isotopes are kind of dumb in their own way and that's what makes them so powerful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're really, for this kind of thing, they're uh -huh. telling us C3 versus C4. Uh -huh. It's telling us where the carbon came from. Yeah. But then we add things like dental morphology, yeah. right? We're talking a little bit more about, you know, the adaptations in some ways of one's ancestors, uh -huh. right? And then something mm -hmm. like dental microwear. Well, that should be telling us about maybe the mechanical properties of the food and so forth and so on. And that's, of course, going to be tied in with the morphology as well. Yeah. So, you know, you put all of this together yeah. and we have a much more compelling package, I think. Um, it makes you a... a, a it makes you a better scientist to think about the way these things go together. I and mean, when you see that your team here sampling the mechanical properties of plants, yeah. for instance, you know, it's, it's saying in order to understand organisms, we have to understand the different aspects that affect them. And those aspects have to do with evolution. They also have to do with what they did this morning. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I mean, one of the things that we focus on the isotope, community really always has to one degree or another is you know the broader context the mammalian community at least yep. mm -hmm. you know because that's one of the other things you know these hominins are not in isolation yeah you know there are there are other primates out there and really there are lots of you know antelope and pigs and things like that uh -huh. and so if we want to if we want a day in the life of these hominids we want to put them put them in their context we've got to be thinking an awful lot about bovids and pigs yeah, yeah. and giraffes because they're really what we have yeah I mean, they're they're what what's with what was there yeah and you know we've we found some really interesting things about those as well yeah well i want to ask you how did you get into this line of work oh gosh um you know i guess i got into this right after Julia was uh -huh. doing the, the initial publication, she and Nick Fundermer at the University of Cape Town. And I, I saw it and I was like, wow, you know, I was at a point where I had really switched. I initially actually went to graduate school as a cultural anthropologist and uh -huh. I was seduced by the dark side and, <laughs> and went over to bio and got, got into early hominin research. And uh -huh. the ecological side of things was always very compelling to yeah. me. Um, and I was like, you know, I immediately saw the kinds of questions we had about how we came to be, to my mind, would, could be very tied up into this sort of C4 uh -huh. question. Uh -huh. When is this there? Yeah. And she showed Paranthropus robustus, you know, as having some of this. And I was like, man, but wouldn't it be interesting to look at something like Australopithecus africanus? Yeah. Because that's where we tend to think of that, at least at that time, we were tending to think of it as kind of a chimpanzee plus. Yeah. You know, there's fleshy fruits and leaves based upon some really great studies. Uh-huh. And, you know, it's likely still today that they ate a lot of those, but I think we know they ate maybe a lot of that kind of thing and then something. Yeah. And yeah, we know yeah. a lot of it was quite C4. And there's some of these Australopithecus africanus individuals that are all the way on the sort of zebra end of thing. Uh -huh. um, you know, and, and back then for, for Julia, for Nick, and for, uh, you know, it was a dream to be able to have the kind of data set we have today where there are over 175 early hominin specimens and well more coming on the way. And we can now ask questions like, well, how did hominins change through time? Yeah. And we can now say at 4 million years, they look this way, you know, 2.5, this 1 million here. And there is a weak but significant relationship. We can now ask questions like, well, how do the how does the dental morphology and the dental, uh, the tooth size and things like that, and the mandibular size mm -hmm. change with the isotopic composition of diets? And it turns out there seems to be a fairly strong relationship between these kinds of things. And possibly this gets us a little bit closer to asking, well, why are these things happening yeah. over the course of hominid yeah. evolution? Yeah. We're not there yet, 
And that's why we're out here doing the kinds of things we are with nutritional mechanical properties uh -huh. of foods. But, you know, we hope in the next few years we'll, we'll make a few important steps. So if a student wanted to get into this field, what would be your suggestion? What should that student do? You know, I... Wow, that's, that's a good one. You know, what, some of the best advice I ever got when I was a graduate student, when Dan Lieberman came as a very young professor to Rutgers, and he uh, told me, don't read, the, don't read the archaeological and anthropological literature for the questions you're interested in. He's mm -hmm. like, go to the medical literature, go to this and that, because they're really going to have a, a better feel for this. And I, I found that to be very true in many mm -hmm. ways. The anthropological literature is wonderful. And there's a lot of important stuff there. But if you want to understand hominins in terms of, you know, the ecology, if you just are reading papers by those of us who are doing this kind of work, you're, you, you know, you're not, you're not doing what you should be doing. You should be spending your time in ecology classrooms. Mm -hmm. You should be spending your time, you know, doing landscape ecology, studying mammals, doing all of this. Because you find out they're asking very different things that we often are paleontologically. But... Sometimes there's just that like little freeze on of excitement where you're like, ah, oh, you know, that's a cool thing that they're doing that we're not usually doing the paleontological side. But now with technology or whatever, we can begin addressing that kind of question. So to me, I really like the idea of if you're interested in the hominin ecology game, yeah. to be trained as broadly as an ecologist as you can. You should yeah. be reading as much about rodents uh -huh. and you know community structure among you know North American mammalian communities as you should be reading about calicotheres and and you know Eurygnathohippus and all these sure. ancient African taxa. Uh -huh. So that would sort of be my take on to how you get into that. And uh -huh. on the morphological side of things, it's complete. It's a different story once again. <laughs> but, all right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, John.